so glad that you're here as we continue this series that we've been in all about the topic of work, career, vocation. And so I'm glad that you're here for this teaching on work on this Labor Day weekend. See what we did there? Like we planned it. <laughs> And you know that each day, each part of the series, if you've been, if you're just joining us for this, welcome. Uh, you, you, the Bible has a lot to say about job, work, career, vocation, whether you earn a, a paycheck and you're at the height of your career, whether you are in school, if you are a student, you're, you're there in elementary school, your career right now is learning your multiplication tables, right? If you are in college, you're, 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 you're plotting out, you're picking your major and all that stuff. If, if, if you are gainfully employed, if, if you're working from home, if you are retired, the Bible has something to say to you about vocation. For me, if you've been a part of this series, for me, maybe you'll agree, the best part has been as the beginning of each sermon, uh, as, as, by way of intro, I've been interviewing a real bona fide worker. And uh, we've uh, talked to uh, uh, managers and uh, a kindergarten teacher, uh, a farmer trucker. Wasn't that great last week? And so we're trying to get various um, uh, uh, fields. And I realized some of the hardest working people don't necessarily draw a paycheck from their work. Uh, and uh, so today uh, we're going to interview what you might call a stay-at-home mom. Now they put in work. Can I get an amen? All right, yeah, okay. Uh, today's interview is, I guess, of particular um, specialness to me uh, for two reasons. One, I cannot believe she agreed to do this. She doesn't like to talk in front of people. And two, I'm totally in love with her. It's my wife, Jackie. Join me in welcoming Jackie Richter up here. There we go. Thanks, guys. Thanks, All right, if the mic feeds back, we'll just, yeah, we'll use that one. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Jackie. <laughs> thanks for doing this. Okay, yeah. so um, you know that uh, uh, in each interview, we start with the preliminary stuff. Uh, who are you and what do you do? But um, I wanted to interview a stay-at-home mom. So in this case, uh, uh, you used to work outside the home. So not only who are you, what do you do, but what did you do? Okay. Yeah, um, yeah I'm Jackie Richter. I, before we had kiddos and I started staying home, I was an elementary school teacher. So in New York, I taught school for 11 years, actually. Um, and then after we had Carson, who's our second, we just decided to make the, the move to staying at home. Awesome. How, how many kids do you have, <laughs> Jackie? <laughs> We have three kids. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't ask me what their ages were. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so we, we started each interview with this question. Colossians 3 verse 23 says um, that we're supposed to work as unto the Lord. Whatever you do, do it with all your heart. As unto the Lord, not unto man. So how can you, as a stay-at-home mom, how can you in the spirit of Colossians 3 23 work as unto the Lord. Right. I think particularly for, for me as a stay-at-home mom, I don't have a boss. At the end of the day, there's no company. There's nobody checking in on me. Um, so my work is unto the Lord. Um, and, you know, just thinking about um, who do I answer to every day, and it is the Lord. Um, I actually read somewhere this week, if you want your work to matter, it matters to whom you're working. Mm. Um, and so I think that's fitting for this verse. You're just thinking about that makes what I do every day a little more meaningful knowing that it's unto the Lord. Amen. Next question, can work be worship? If so, how? Sure. So this week we were actually talking, and Tom mentioned, you know, the word worship and the word service actually means the same thing. It gets interchanged a lot. What time is your service? What time is your worship? Yeah. Um, so when I think about, like, most of my day as a stay-at-home mom, it's very mundane tasks. So I'm folding laundry. I'm cleaning bathrooms. I'm making lunches. These things are not exciting things, um, but you just think about them as, as I'm serving my family, I'm also, I can use that as a way to worship the Lord. He he gave me these kiddos as a gift, as a blessing, so just as a way to say thank you and, and worship him, I can serve my family that way. Amen. All right, my hunch is that there are many folks in our church that, uh, that work very hard, but they don't directly 
draw a paycheck for their work, right? I mean, right. Um, it could be that they're keeping kids so, so another spouse can work, but their work doesn't directly equate to a paycheck. And so, um, you know, I've got this whole series on work and I'm thinking, but, but what if your work doesn't directly tie to a paycheck? Speak to that. What are some of the unique struggles that come with working very hard but not having your work directly linked to a, to a paycheck? Yeah, sure. So I think, you know, a paycheck is almost like validation that every week you've done a good job. You are doing what you're supposed to be doing at work. And without that paycheck, um, it's almost like I'm looking for my self-worth, some validation, whatever that is. In, I have to find it in something. Mm. Uh, so, you know... If I were doing the right thing, I would be saying, you know, I'm a child of God and my identity is found in, in Christ and who he is and who he's made me. Um, sadly, I think most days I get it wrong and I try to find that self-worth and that validation in my kids. So did they make an A on this test? Did they score a goal? Did they say yes, ma'am, instead of yeah? Or whatever it is I'm asking them to do, you know, I'm almost, I'm putting all of my weight, the weight of that on these little kids, almost like making them an idol instead of just trusting God and who I am in him. I'm, I'm trying to find that from, from these sweet kiddos. Wow. I think a lot of people uh, can relate to that. Uh, fourth question. Since you've left working outside the home, we've kind of asked, this is like a two-part question, right? It, it kind of opposite sides. We've asked everybody this. Can you describe an incident or a time or a season when you experienced some victory in this, working under the Lord, and like you said, when I'm thinking right, I get my identity from Him. And then the follow-up is, what about maybe a regret where I, I didn't get it right? right? So we can sort of take those in that order, you know, about a victory, and then um, the, the follow-up question is, what about a, oh, a, you know, a regret? Yeah, I mean, I think for most moms, just as I'm talking to moms, I feel like that victory is really hard to find. I think, you know, mom <laughs> guilt is a real thing, you yeah, know. I think yeah. we um, really struggle with finding the things that we get it right. I know I often feel guilty. I mean, I, I feel very blessed to be able to stay home with our kids. But I also feel guilty not being at work and not providing, you know, monetarily for them. Um, and I know moms that work, I know they are the opposite side. Yeah. Like, I miss field trips. I miss being there. All these things. I just think no matter what, moms are going to find a way to feel guilty and yeah. not be able to find the victory in that, you know? Yeah, that mom guilt is real. Do you remember when, when we had Katie, somebody sent us this meme, and it's like— um, to, it's like a dad and a mom, and it's like what they're thinking. They're lying in bed, and it's their thought bubbles. Right. And the mom's is like, um, uh, d you know, did, did I feed them? Did I feed them too much? Did I feed them not enough? Are they safe? Did I use the right diaper? What if I've messed up? And the dad only has one thought bubble, and it's, I'm an awesome dad. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, I, think, I think a lot of, you know, I think you're yeah. right. I think there's a mom deal. Uh, okay, so, <laughs> so since there's no victories. I know. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure there are some. Yeah, tell us, all, <laughs> tell us about then the regrets or the times where you feel like you didn't get it right. Yeah, and I think, you know, those are probably many. Um, but I think, you know, just this week, we're, we've been talking about this interview yeah. this week um, as you've been trying to, like, make me do it. But um, <laughs> I... <laughs> So Thursday morning, we're getting our kids ready. It's always crazy in our house in the morning. We're always 10 minutes late for school. Like, so we're like yelling, screaming, getting everybody ready. And I'm fixing Anna's hair. She's our five-year-old. And um, I go just automatically, she wears the bow every day. And I put the bow in. She's like, nope, I'm not wearing a bow anymore. I am done with bows. And I'm like, excuse me, what? No, 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 we can't make this decision today. You know, we got to go. And so I get upset. She's crying. Tom's standing in the kitchen like, what has just happened like to my family? And so um, we get out the door. She does not wear a bow and we get out the door. Um, but later, like I'm reflecting on it, like what happened? You know, she's five and she doesn't want to wear a bow. Like it's not the end of the world. Um, so part of it, I think, you know, just she's my little girl. She's growing up. But Part of it's grief that right she's she's, that, she's right. growing up, but I think the more you know the the more I don't know the evil part of it was you know here I am thinking like what will people think of me if my little girl shows up at school without a bow like you know it's yeah. like what are people gonna think she's not put together she doesn't have it all together this mom is struggling and I'm like I am struggling you know and yeah. it's and so but I think you know that's a real thing. Um, you know, just kind of struggling through that and just realizing, like, instead, what if I thought, I hope my kid is nice to somebody today, yeah. or I hope my yeah. kid loves somebody today. You know, I really, I wish I thought that instead of, you have to wear a bow. 
Yeah, yeah. And I see what you're saying. It's a little thing, but you're sort of tying your, I guess, goodness as a mom right. into this thing. Yeah, like and it just people happens. are judging yeah. me. Yeah. Right, yeah. 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 And to be clear, we're not like a not like a bow. Like you're like a little sweet hair yeah, bow. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like you don't bring your bow to school. I mean, they got like archery. Okay. Uh, I promise to stick to this. That was the deal we made. Um, <laughs> that wasn't a question. Yeah, I know. Last question then: Is there a particular scripture or verse or passage or story that you find yourself as a stay-at-home mom coming back to over and over in this season of life? Yeah, so I know, I mean, the second we found out we were going to be parents, I mean, my anxiety levels shot through the roof, you know, and I feel like um, just, I mean, over the last 10 years, I just feel I'm always anxious. So Philippians 4, 6, and 7, do, na- do not be anxious about anything, but with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, mm. present your quest to the Lord, and the peace that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and mind. And I know for me, I've just prayed that over and over and over over the last 10 years. There are nights that you're up with a sick kid or you're, you know, there's all kinds of things that are happening. And I just come back to that, to that verse over and over and over. And they don't always like, they don't always have to even make sense. Uh, right. Yeah. Many of my fears and anxieties do not. I mean, I'll be like, Tom, what if a dragon comes and gets our kids? And he's like, that is never going to happen. It's very I'm rare. Like, it could. Yeah. What if it happens? Like, you know, it's like, I don't know what it is, but my mind can produce all these crazy thoughts and scenarios. Um, so you just need something to kind of quiet those fears. And that verse is, usually helps me with that. And, and I've learned a lot from you about that verse as I've watched you pray through this. You've taught me a lot. Because, I mean, it's easy to, like, laugh at a mom who has these crazy fears. And it's easy to be like, oh, that could never happen. But what if we were talking about this church? Right. See, then it'd be the, it'd be, yeah. you know. I'd, I'm talking you tr- off the ledge. A <laughs> dragon is going to eat all of our church members, Jackie. It could happen, you know. And, uh, um, so it, we may not have the same idols, but I think right. it's interesting. It's easy to say, oh, these moms, they have these anxieties. You know, we make an idol, say, out of career or work or whatever. So, um, boy, I really appreciate you doing it. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to pray for, uh, pray for Jackie, and just as I've done for everybody, and also pray for all those who are putting in work, and maybe they don't draw a paycheck from the work. But will you join me in praying? Uh, for, our, for our moms and for everybody who's uh, uh, working so hard. Heavenly Father, thank you for the series on work. Uh, God, I thank you for Jackie and how she blesses me and blesses our family. And I thank you for the love she has for this church, uh, the way she prays for and encourages uh, and loves the, the moms especially and all those uh, in, our, in our church. And uh, God, I pray for everybody who's working hard, but their work doesn't directly yield a paycheck. I pray, oh God, that they would not seek validity in that or significance, but rather work as under the Lord and that they would seek that uh, which is only found in you. And Lord, I pray for those uh, moms who, des- who would love to stay at home but are, are working, and I pray, oh God, you grant to them favor as they're, they're balancing all that. God, thank you for this series, and I pray as we look at the word today about the thorns and thistles of work, how it can so easily become an idol, I pray you teach us and speak to our hearts, Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, show some appreciation to Jackie. Hey, thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, you need a hand? Okay. Yeah, make sure you land yeah, Good deal. Yeah. Thanks, Scott. Well, Jackie uh, could not have given us a better segue into this morning's topic because, uh, uh, to me, she, she really got to the root of some stuff there. Um, th- thank you. Some insightful stuff about our motives and our motivations for work. And uh, I think that uh, work can, if we're not careful, work can actually become an idol in our life. And so as we talk about the deep things inside our heart, it's probably not surprising that for a text today, we're going to go all the way back to the beginning. Not all the way back, but pretty close. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 11. Our text today about work is going to be some work that they tried to accomplish in Genesis 11th chapter. Uh, As you're turning there, I recently reread an article from Marshall Seagal about how work can become an idol, and he had this great title for uh, an article. He called it, The Lethal Drug in Your Dream Job. The Lethal Drug in Your Dream Job. And uh, the point of his article was that success is the drug of choice among many Americans because it gets to our motivations. Now, there's nothing wrong with uh, success in your career, and I wish you great success in your career, but what's the motivation behind the success? What's really driving that? 
Do you want a higher salary so that you can give more and have more leverage in your giving to give more to the ministry? Maybe, maybe you want more influence so that you could influence more people with the gospel or maybe God's gifted you for more than you're able to give in your current role. That, that's great. But we all know there's some sinister things that lie underneath motivation at well, as well. This is what Seagal writes. Success at work will play God and make promises to you that it cannot and will not keep. That's so good. Listen to this. Promi success promises to fill holes in our hearts. If you only ascend this high or accumulate this much, your fears and insecurities will be resolved once for all. Success promises the love of those around us. They'll finally give you the respect and affection you crave. Success says it can cover everything wrong about us. It offers esteem, control, security, everything we surrendered in our sin. Success wears the Savior's costume, but it's a horrible hero and a counterfeit God. According to Nathan Hatch, president of Wake Forest University, students are pursuing lucrative and powerful pr professions. He's making an observation. He's a president of a, of a university there in North Carolina. He's making an observation. Here's what he writes. Students are pursuing lucrative and powerful professions like finance, law, and specialized medicine. Those are not wrong to pursue. That, that you can absolutely glorify God in finance and law and specialized medicine. But here's what he writes. They're pursuing it with little reference to the larger questions of meaning and purpose. In other words, they seem to choose professions not in answer to the question, what helps people flourish? They're choosing professions based only on the answer to the question, what will help me to flourish? So what about you? What are you aiming for in your career? What's really driving this? Is it a desire to, to work for the world around you or a desire to, for yourself? Is, is it about making life count for the good of others or about having your own little slice of heaven here? You see the subtleness of this, how work could become an idol. That's why I didn't start the series with this. I started with work is good. I talked about how work is a calling. Work is a good gift from God. One of the thorns and thistles are that we can take a good gift and make it an idol. In fact, Tim Keller says, the better the thing, the more likely we turn it into an idol. Listen, if you, if you think of an idol, if you define idol as something we worship other than God, this will make no sense. Because I don't know anybody that goes around worshiping work. But if you define idol properly, if you define idol as anything or anyone that we trust to save us, anything or anyone that we are looking to to provide comfort or security or control, I can find what I need in that or in this other than God, that's an idol. And if you, if you, if you say, well, an idol is something that I look to to provide that which only God can give, now this makes sense. You see the danger in this. Otherwise, you could go through work your whole career and say, what? I've done nothing wrong. I, I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to feed my family. Nothing wrong with that, is there? I'm just doing this. You know, I'm out here. Nothing wrong with being successful. It's sneaky. It's subtle. So what do we need? We need a heart of wisdom. We need discernment. And we need to get back to the roots of what causes this idolatry behind work. And so for that, let's turn to, again, here we are, Genesis 11, you've already turned there. This uh, famous story, you know it, it's the story of the building of the Tower of Babel. Genesis 11, verse 1, let's start in verse 1. Now, the whole world had one language and a common speech. Now, that's something, isn't it? I mean, just ponder that. Everybody could understand each other. No need for translation. There was nothing that threw you, <laughs> there were no Yankee accents, y'all, right? Very easy. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. Now, now th this move eastward, some commentators say this is foreshadowing. Uh, they say that the, when, the Lord when, when the Lord God planted the garden, Genesis 2, when the Lord God planted the garden in the east, so, so as they're moving here, right, the, the, the garden has been planted. The move eastward is often a move away from God's original intent. At any rate, it may or may not be foreshadowing. Verse 3, they said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. See, they used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. What is this verse about? Well, somebody figured out a new technology. They could build it using inexpensive materials. See, stone and mortar is very expensive, but we can bake these bricks and tar. Man, we can build like never before. 
We can, somebody makes a new technology, and what do they do? They go to the big city to show it off, see if they can get a patent. Maybe they can get bought out, right? Very exciting, this new technology. So they say, here's what we're going to do. We got the technology to do it. We got everybody here. Verse 4. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city. And at the center of the city, what do we need? A tower that reaches to the heavens. Now pause there. In the center of the city is their tower. Now you may think of it as a modern day skyscraper. No, at the center of their city, this is a temple. This is a ziggurat. Do you remember social studies class? Remember your history class? A ziggurat. Big pyramid with the, the top chopped off to make a flat place. Stairs that you could climb all the way to, to what? To the heavens. To the place of the gods. And if you dragged a sacrifice all the way up those stairs and laid it down and that got sacrificed, surely your pagan god would give you what you wanted because you did all this. At the center of their city was, was getting God on their side, right? And so they build that. Uh, it occurs to me now, um, I didn't say this er earlier, it, it occurs to me, it, it may, I don't know if you can make the case or not, you may be able to make the case that at the center of the city is still towers toward their gods. The tallest towers in New York City are for what? Finance. They're trading firms, they're banks, they're houses of money, exchange. The tallest places in D.C., they don't allow big banks to have the skyscrapers, do they? The tallest buildings there are government buildings, power. In Hollywood, what's on the you know, big sign, right? Maybe you could make the case that cities still build these towers. I don't know if you can make the case, so I'll just throw it out there as if you can and move on. <laughs> anyway, I want you to see that this is re there, there's a religious element to this. Their tower is going to be a ziggurat. We're going to be able to get to God. A tower, I want you to picture a ziggurat that reaches to the heavens. So that, so we build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches the heaven. Why? so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered all over the face of the whole earth. You see that? What do they want? They want glory and they want protection. Uh, 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 Derek uh, Kinder in his commentary says they want to glorify and they want to fortify. They're looking for security and they're looking for glory and they're looking for it on their own strength. Some, some, some things to note here in this verse. There's a lot here. I want you to note, first of all, that technically, if you know your Genesis history, technically, even their attempt to stay put was an act of disobedience. Over and over, uh, three times, by my count, God has already said to them, rule over the whole earth, multiply, rule over, be fruitful and multiply, and what? And fill the earth. He has called them to fill the whole earth, and they're saying, nah, we're good here. Now, side note, church, throughout history, it hasn't changed. God's call is ever outward for his glory to going to sending to giving man's sin is to withdraw inward self we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna protect ourselves, not worry about what's out there but at any rate they want to stay in one place now specifically what do they want they want a city a tower a great name a city a home they're looking for belonging a tower that reaches to the heavens and to make a name for themselves now none of these things are oh none of these things are wrong you see why this is such a subtle issue it's not wrong to want security it's not wrong hey i'm going to get a job then i can put food on my table that's not a wrong desire i want my career to get built to bigger and bigger platforms why well I, it's, it's not necessarily wrong but why to make a name for myself Ugh. it's not wrong to want to be significant it's not it's not it's not it's not wrong to want this tower it's not even wrong to have a desire to reach out to god to the divine but what are they doing? Sin is an attempt to find in something or someone else, to, to, to find something that you lost in God. In other words, what I'm saying is that they had these things in the Garden of Eden, and now they're trying to get back something they once had in God. They're going to call this tower Babel, which literally means the gate of God. Later in the Old Testament, it gets translated Babylon. It's a happy coincidence that the English word Babel, nonsense talk, uh, is all, you know, it's, it's a nice little play on words there, but it means gate of God. They're going to try to build it up. Here's my application, point number one. And I give credit to Pastor J.D. Greer out at the Summit Church in North Carolina. His, his work on this, I, I, I phrased some of this stuff exactly like J.D. Greer. I took it from, from his, his uh, research on it. Look at this first point. Work becomes an idol when we look to our work to give us that which can only come from God. Work becomes an idol when we look to our work to give us that which can only come from God. 
the desire to belong or for security or for greatness. They're not wrong. It's where we're looking that's wrong. Several thousand years later, people haven't changed. We still desire these things, just in different forms. A city. We want security. We want our lives to matter. We, we, the reason family is so important, the reason being accepted by the right groups at school when you're a kid, or when you get older, you want to be in the right sorority, or the, or the best fraternity, or, or the best clubs. And then when you get to work, you, th- there's work, and there's your coworkers, but there's that one group of coworkers, and they're the really cool group. Or, or there's this, this one uh, uh, click of people in a town and you mean if you get in there why because then I'll be accepted I want to belong I want that city and security so we want something to guarantee our safety that's not necessarily wrong but there comes a point where you cross a line and I don't know your heart I don't know your heart but our security is only found in God there comes a line that we cross when we look to get our security on our own terms that may be why you know insurance is a trillion dollar industry in this country. Now, I'm not against insurance. I, I have insurance. I want that to go on record. I think that's a great idea. I think that's a great concept, okay? Insurance, two thumbs up. But sometimes you get the idea, don't you? That we're looking to remove any sort of risk in our life when at the end, just like our brother prayed before the offering, at the end, we don't, how much do we really control? Um, I, I, I found this. I didn't believe it when I heard it, so I looked it up, and my assistant uh, came. I showed it to her just so you, people don't think I'm crazy. She saw it too. Um, for a, a, a small premium each year, there's a product, an insurance product available. For a small premium each year, you can purchase alien insurance. <laughs> <laughs> Truth is out there, people. Yeah, if you don't know what alien insurance is, for a small premium a year, there are companies you can go to where if you pay each year and if you get abducted by aliens, your family gets $500,000. For $118 a year premium, you get $500,000 given to your family. If you can prove you've been eaten by aliens, they get $3 million. You say, Pastor, how do I know if I've made security an idol in my life? Well, one indication to me would be if you heard that and you thought, that's ridiculous, you're probably good. If you heard that and thought, honey, find out where that website is. Uh, (laughs) It may be an idol in your life. Now, it's easy to laugh at that, but do we not do the same thing as a a helicopter parent who's trying to control every environment, right? If they get in the littlest bit of a a, a misunderstanding at school, I'm going to swoop right in there and I'm going to explain this. I'm going to hash it out. If they're going to be hurt, I'm all over them. Why? Because I'm I'm attempting to secure them in ways where at some point as a parent, I got to say, I'm going to be the best parent I can, but they're God's kid and he alone can protect them. What if you're a helicopter pastor? I gotta make sure they're always right. I gotta make sure they're always doing good. What if one little sheep, right? At some point, don't, don't, doesn't a helicopter, fine. Don't I have to say? <laughs> At the end of the day, I'm gonna be the best pastor I can, but they're not my church. They're God's church. And he's their good shepherd, right? Now, 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 now you'll have to apply that to yourself, but at some point, don't you know when you're gripping too tight and God's calling you, you gotta take your hands off this. Security can so easily become an idol in our life when we think we can find ultimate security in anything or anyone other than God. And what about make a name for ourselves? Whoo! Man, I, I, I always think back, and a guy said, it was this brilliant seminary professor, just dry and mean and angry and crotchety. And uh, I remember one day he sold all these, you know, he, he had these great books and he sold all these books. And he just said it as an offhand comment, but I've never forgotten it because I know exactly what he meant. And he, and he said, um, uh, some, he, I mean, sold all these famous books. And he looked at our class and he said, well, you know, I don't take a dime off these books. You know, I give all this to charity. I don't take a dime. He said, because I don't want to be rich. I want to be famous. <laughs> and that's what, exactly what happened. Like a few people laughed nervously, but he was admitting something. that hit, The idol for him, see, wasn't wealth. It was to make a name for myself. Now, I don't know which, you, which one your idol is, right? Is it the city? Is it the tower? Is it to make a name for myself? Is it a little bit of all three? Is it control? Is it significance? Or is it comfort? 
For some of you, you've made an idol out of control, and that is what you've geared your entire life around instead of saying, God, you're in control. For others, it's significance. I have got to be known. I've got deep insecurities, and the right people have to say I'm okay. In fact, one way you know that significance is an idol, you'll be two different people based on the crowd you're with. Why? Because significance is an idol in your life or comfort. No one's against comfort. But for some of you, God's called you to this great and glorious mission to declare his glory among all nations. And Satan doesn't even have to try to trip you up. He just has to give you a, 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 a Netflix and, 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 and a comfortable couch. And next thing you know, we've, we've missed out because comfort's become an idol in our life. Well, it's not... I just want you to see it's not wrong to want significance. It's not wrong to want security. It's not wrong to want greatness, right? That longing for greatness is why we're always name dropping, you know? I was talking to former President Bush last week about this, and he, um, <laughs> you know, he was saying, Tom, you're a name dropper. And, I, and then Jordan was like, it's, he's right. It was, it was crazy. Um, but that's why we take selfies, right? J.D. Greer's got this great line about, about uh, how even Christian leaders, we take these selfies with uh, 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 famous people, you know, several years ago, right? You'd see all these posts, had lunch today with Billy Graham, hashtag humbled by this. And Greer's point was, you're absolutely not humbled by this. This is the opposite of humbled. He said, nobody ever takes a picture that they're truly humbled by. Nobody's ever like, forgot to have my quiet time humbled by this, right? Didn't feed my kid. <laughs> Hit a kid on the way to school. Like, no, humbled by this, you know? Nobody says things are actually humbled by it. What do we say? We want to be connected to greatness. That's not necessarily wrong, but am I going to work each day? Am I looking for a career, whether paid or unpaid, because I think that will define me? Is that what will ultimately keep me safe? Is that what's going to make a name for myself? Or do I go to work, do, paid or unpaid, knowing God defines me, God keeps me safe, God gives me a name, and my identity is in Him? At some point, I hope you'll ask the question in your heart, well, how do I know? How do I know if work's becoming an idol? This is a compelling case for idolatry and work, but how do I know? Okay, let's keep reading. Verse 5, but... The Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. Now, this is a clever play on words, right? The, the people are going to build this tower. It's going to be this great feat of human achievement. Look what we can do. A tower that, like has never been seen before. A tower that reaches to the heavens and as high as they get. What does it say the Lord has to do to come see it? The Lord's got to come down. The Lord has to condescend to see what these little humans are doing. In verse 6, the Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they've begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Ah, in other words. Now, if you know the end of the story, you know that God is going to judge them, and he's going to judge them by uh, uh, confusing their language and by scattering them. Now, here's why that's a mercy. That is a restraint on sin. If they all speak the same language, and this is what they're wanting to do, they're wanting to build a tower of pride by their will, in their strength, for their own glory. He says, if we don't put a stop to this, if, 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 this, if we don't somehow restrain this, then having one language is only going to amplify what's already in the human heart. That is an important word for us in 2019. Why? Technology. Is it good or bad? The answer probably is, well, depends. Exactly. Here's my contention. I believe technology is neither good nor bad. It's an amplifier. Technology merely amplifies what's already in the human heart. And there's a lot of good that's in the human heart, but it's also a lot that's not. That's why technology just amplifies it. 50 or 100 years ago, if somebody's house burned down here in town, everybody's heart went out to them. So what would you do? As best you can, you'd try to gather some money together and you'd bless them. Do you know now when somebody's house burned down, you could set up a GoFundMe and raise tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars in hours. Why? Because technology has amplified that good intention of the human heart. Praise the Lord. That is literally the only good example I could think of for technology, okay? Everything else. Right? Because when somebody ranted on politics, at least they were alone with like a tinfoil hat, a shotgun, a jug of water, and a, you know, a one-eyed dog. Rah! Pilot. Now it's all over Facebook. Right? 
Why? Because technology simply amplifies, and so we've got a lot of good in our heart. But as the Tower of Babel shows, there's also a lot of wickedness, and this one language, this technology, this, 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 uh, it's, speaking one language, it was almost like they had a media, they had a, a medium of communication. They had like a web, uh, a, like a network. What am I trying to describe? It's like worldwide, like, like, a, like a worldwide web of social media back then is the best way I could, I know there's nothing like that today. But their their language allowed them to do that. It did what? It amplified what was in their hearts. And what was in their hearts? Sin's root. Sin's root, by my will, in my strength, for my glory. Security, significance, and greatness, the desire for that is not necessarily wrong. But they they were supposed to get that through depending on God. Now, they want to do it for themselves, in their own way, by their strength, so that they alone get the glory. Let's build ourselves a tower for the glory of our name. Again, I quote J.D. Greer when he teaches his kids about sin. I know there may be some little kids in the room who can hear me. Sin is very easy to understand. Sin is a little word where I is always in the middle. S-I-N. What I want instead of what God wants. In my strength instead of God's. So that I get the glory and attention, not him. Sin begins not with the immorality of the act, but with the heart behind the act. And that's why God says this tower is going to result in immeasurable amounts of sin. And sure enough, Babel, or Babylon, as it's translated elsewhere, sure enough, it goes on to be a symbol of mankind's opposition against God, the epitome of wickedness. Babylon's the name of the capital city of Israel's fiercest enemy in the Old Testament. By the way, the kingdom that destroys Jerusalem and takes Israel captive is Babylon. And in Revelation, Babylon is the symbol of man's united front against God at the last battle. This is the simplest way I know to ask it. If you're looking for a diagnostic, are you working or are you desiring to work? Or whether you're working from home or whether you're retired, in your vocation, are you working for love or for pride? Simple as I know how to put it. How do I know if I'm working out of pride? How do I know when I'm walking in pride? A good friend of mine, C.S. Lewis, says there's one telltale sign that you walk in pride. Jealousy. Lewis has this really insightful passage because he wrote it where he says that the thing about pride is it's utterly competitive in its essence. And that's why the way you know you're deeply enmeshed in pride, the way you know you're full of pride, is how quickly you can sniff out pride in other people. It's like your pride radar is set to maximum. Why? Because you're competitive and your pride, pride recognizes pride, see? in other people. It's essentially competitive. Other sins aren't like that. Drunks love to hang out with other drunks. People who are wrapped up in immorality love to wrap up and be with, they love to, other immorality. Fine. Uh, 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 drug addicts want to hang out with other drug addicts. You know that? Like certain sins, you want to hang out with other people who are doing your sin. Pride can't stand to be with other proud people. Kills them. Why? Because the pride, it doesn't matter that a prideful person's smart, it's that they're smarter than the other guy. It doesn't matter that they're good looking, it's that they're better looking than someone else. In fact, in Dante's Inferno, when he describes the layer of hell for the greedy, the people, you know, pridefully going after all this wealth, the hell for them, as he describes it, is every person who's greedy for an eternity in hell gets all the wealth in the world. They get unlimited wealth. The reason it's hell, their neighbor gets unlimited wealth too. It was never about the money. It was about having more than someone else. Pride is essentially competitive. When you walk past a building that you didn't build, do you think, I'm grateful that building went up? Maybe I wish I'd gotten the contract, fine. But that is an incredible piece of work, and I can admire that work for what it is. Or are you burning up inside? When somebody else uh, gets a good grade, do you think, man, you know, I wish I'd worked harder, but, you know, good for them, they got that good grade. Or do you think, you know, that good grade, oh, I know how they're going to be. And they're going to rub it in everybody's face because, oh, now they're going to think they're something. And them being something takes some of my somethingness away. Right? You hear that? Now, I don't know how to apply it to your situation, but you, you know. So watch what happens to man's prideful work. Let's wrap this up. God says in verse 7, come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. Can you imagine? That's a whole sermon in and of itself. I won't preach it, but 
Like they, every day they've been able to understand each other. The very next day they go to work and suddenly nobody can understand each other. Hey, would you hand me a hammer? Did you just call me a bammer? <laughs> like, I, mean, I, really, I think it'd be funny. I'm trying to be contextual. The point is nobody can understand each other. Now they get in all these fights. Verse 8, so the Lord scattered them there, uh, scattered, scattered them there, people. The Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it's called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Go back to verse 8. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth, over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. Uh, did anyone find it interesting that God didn't tear down the tower? I mean, if it had been me, I'd been like, oh, that's a great project. That's a total monument to pride. It's going to destroy everything. Squash. God leaves a unfinished, rotting tower of disappointment. Why would he do that? He leaves a rotting tower of disappointment. He frustrates their work, confuses their language, and scatters them. Let me ask you something. To leave an unfinished tower, to frustrate their language, to scatter them, was it a judgment or a mercy? That's right. It was both. If he did not confuse their language and scatter them, they would have been able to do unthinkable damage to themselves. He's trying to let them taste early on the disappointment of their sin before they go fully down that path. Listen to me carefully. Any judgment of God that comes into your life before the final judgment when it's too late is a mercy. Let me say it again. Any judgment of God that comes into your life before the final judgment when it's too late is absolutely a mercy. He's trying to rescue you. He's, the re, look around your life. Are there, are there rotting towers of disappointment? Why would God leave them there? Look around your career. Anywhere, any, is anywhere you look in your past, in your life, right now, maybe in your present, is there a rotting tower of disappointment? Why would God leave a broken tower in your life? Was it a broken relationship? A drug addiction? Humiliation? A lost job? Did you get caught cheating and you got kicked out? What if you learn to think about these disappointments in your life, these broken towers, as monuments with a message that scream, return to God. He's not trying to pay you back. He's trying to bring you back. He loves you. Return to what you once knew. Return that only in him is your security. Only in him is your comfort. And in nowhere else. You want to belong? You can belong to him. You want to belong to a family? Chuck's going to come and lead us in an invitation. You know, you, you think about what God is doing and the good news Babel points to. Like, like at, at Pentecost, right? After the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, he says, wait in the city. And after 50 days, sure enough, the Holy Spirit comes down. And there at Pentecost, you got all these nations gathered and they preach the gospel. And every nation gets to hear in his own language the curse is being undone. He's building something, not a tower that we can build, the tower he's building. And isn't that a picture? The reason there's a broken tower, every time a human attempt to get to God, it's bound to fail because humans can't build their way to God, not through morals, not through good deeds, not through money, not through significance. We can't get to God. So God would have to come down to us, and one day 2,000 years ago, that's exactly what he did. As a little baby, born in a manger, born in Bethlehem, God came to us. And when he came to us, of all the things he gave us, of all the things he gave us, you know, that baby, that brave little boy, born in a manger, born in Bethlehem. He grew up, he lived a spotless life. He died a sinner's death on Calvary's cross. And in his life, his ministry, his death, burial, his resurrection, and his ascension, he fulfilled scriptures. That's what he did. And one of the most beautiful promises in scripture, he fulfilled it's an ancient one, but you hear it every week, almost every week. You hear it many weeks. You may not even know it. When I pronounce the benediction over God's people at the end of every service, I, use, I choose a benediction, a blessing from the Bible. But my favorite, and the one I go back to over and over and over again, is from the sixth chapter of Numbers. It's where this whole idea of blessing God's people comes from. And in Numbers chapter 6, the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you're to bless the Israelites. Say this to them. The Lord, you know this one. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Do you know the verse that comes after that? Right, right as he closes the chapter, what does he say? In this way, 
I will put my name on my people. So are you working to make a name for yourself? Or will you receive by grace the name he has made for you? The name that he's earned for you? Will you go to work this week knowing it's all by grace? And in new heaven, new earth, he made good on that promise. New heaven, new earth. What is it? What's written on the forehead of the saints? His name. His name. Receive it by grace. You don't have to build some tower for your legacy. Your legacy, it's it's his legacy. You don't have to make a name for yourself. It's his name that's above every name. You don't have to go to work to earn anything from God. You can go to work out of the overflow and the abundance of love that comes from knowing who you are in him. Otherwise, it'll be an idol and it'll destroy you and probably destroy your work too. Let's live out of a gospel-centered work this week. Let's pray. God, grant that we might find that city we're looking for in your heavenly city. God, grant that we might put to rest the building of some religious tower instead trust in the finished work of your son on the cross and lord instead of trying to build a name and a legacy for ourselves, let us live by grace and every day work and walk in the free and easy rhythms of your grace knowing that if we lost everything at work we wouldn't lose the most important thing in the world and that's you thank you for your promise thank you for your faithfulness God, I know we have so many hard workers in this church. Oh, God, protect their hearts. Guard their hearts. Idolatry is so subtle and so sneaky. Guard us, oh, God, that we might trust in you. We pray this in Jesus' name.